Hello and welcome to Sleep Reviews webinar, Diagnosis and Management of Sleep Apnea in Cardiology Patients. I'm Sri Roy, editor of Sleep Review, and I'm here with three esteemed speakers, Dr. Hitendra Patel, Rodney Horton, and Yelena Tumashova. After the three presentations, we'll answer audience questions. You can submit your cardio sleep-related questions via the Q&A chat box on the bottom left of your screen. The slide deck is available for PDF download via the Documents folder on the far right corner of your screen. The icon looks like a file folder. Click on the folder, then scroll to the file with the title sr underscore cardiosleep.pdf. Again, the file name you are looking for for today's webinar is sr underscore cardiosleep.pdf. The webinar is free for attendees courtesy of sponsorship by Itamar Medical and Cardio and Sleep Solutions by Itamar Medical. For a certificate of attendance, which is available for the live webinar only, you must meet a few criteria. You must watch the webinar on its original air date of April 24th at about 11 a.m. Pacific time for at least 60 minutes. You must respond to the about four pop-ups that will appear on your screen during the webinar. They will stay on your screen for about eight seconds each and will say, please click OK to confirm your presence. You must complete the exit survey, which will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar or when you personally leave the event, whichever is earlier. Even if you don't have a need for a certificate, we'd certainly appreciate it if you'd give us your feedback via the exit survey. The certificate will only be issued to the name and email address of the person who registered for today's event. So if you are watching the event as a team, you need to register separately now if every team member wants their own certificate. Certificates are automatically emailed by the webinar provider within an hour of the end of this webinar. If you think the software made a mistake, you can email me at sroy at medcore.com. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Hitendra Patel, MD. Dr. Patel earned his medical degree from University of Wales College of Medicine. He pursued his residency at New York Infirmary Beekman Downtown Hospital and his senior residency at the University of Texas Health Science Center. Dr. Patel was a medical director of the sleep lab at Cabell Huntington Hospital and oversaw the sleep lab accreditation by the AASM. Dr. Patel joined Marietta Pulmonary Medicine, now Wellstar Pulmonary Medicine, in 1998. He became medical director of the Wellstar Sleep Program in 2011 and has been the practice leader at Wellstar Pulmonary Medicine since 2016. In the same year, the Wellstar cardiology team introduced WASPAT to Dr. Patel, and he continues to work very closely with his cardiology colleagues to help their many patients with comorbid sleep apnea. Welcome, Dr. Patel. We're ready to hear your insights. Good afternoon. Thank you, Sri, and thank you to the Itamar team for uh, asking me to present this afternoon uh, with two other excellent speakers as well. Um, I disclose no conflicts of interest, but I am a consultant for Itamar for the purposes of this uh, webinar. So what I wanted to basically just get some basics out of the way initially is to discuss sleep apnea. And for the purposes of this talk, bear in mind that we are discussing obstructive sleep apnea and we will not be referring to central sleep apnea unless, at least for my purposes, unless specifically stated. And the reasons we're choosing this, it is the most common sleep disorder. The reason it occurs because the exaggerated relaxation and collapse of the upper pharyngeal airway which results in repeated inter interruptions in breathing and recurrent uh, episodes of hypoxia and arousal during sleep. Now, when we look in the back of a mouth on a patient, we can gauge the risk of a patient having sleep apnea based on the grade of obstruction, malum Patti score. And you can see, and many of you may have looked in the posterior oropharynx, when you really don't see any, um, when, when there's just occlusion by tongue and palate, that's going to be a high-risk airway. And essentially, what we're referring to here is the mechanical structural problem of this uh, entity. And that really uh, also underscores some of the problems we encounter in treatment. There is no easy remedy, and we'll touch on that later. 
background information on the epidemiology and prevalence, it is a very common condition. We can see, and I'm not going to read these numbers, they're in your slide deck and you can see them. Uh, it is extremely common. It is becoming more uh, recognized and it's not that it's happening more frequently. I think it is a function of just the medical community and the general public becoming more aware of this. And also keep in mind, there is the op obesity epidemic, which really I think is in large part also accounting for the increase as well. Again, underscoring the risk factors of sleep apnea, obesity, as we made, as, as I said before, was the number one risk factor. Then additional risk factors, anything that will cause further relaxation of the muscle tone in those upper airway muscles that we talked about, as well as certain neuromuscular disorders, uh, and then structural abnormalities and certain endocrine disorders will also predispose and uh, pose risk uh, for the upper airway. Again, a little bit more uh, background and just putting things in perspective of the degree of concern we're talking about worldwide as well as in the U.S., 20 million Americans. And look at the last uh, couple of bullet points. It's significant number of patients are underdiagnosed and or untreated as well. And that's where I think our real serious challenge lies because we're already seeing the patients who present to us, but there is a big, big, um, what I've always referred to for the last 10, 15 years is that we're seeing the tip of the iceberg and we still, there's a huge amount that we're not seeing below the surface as well. And again, these next couple of slides are underscoring that same point as well. There's a huge number of patients that we really don't, uh, know about and it, that's where I think uh, webinars like this, education, uh, just basically getting the word out to our ph physician colleagues, medical colleagues and also in the community is a key uh, step that we can improve on. Again, th these, these slides are just letting everybody know what kind of epidemic we're dealing with in terms of the numbers and then thinking about this in a financial sense, it has a huge economic impact in terms of uh, workplace accidents, motor vehicle accidents, production of uh, productivity lost, and then ultimately with the comorbid diseases, and then the cost of illness and treating those patients because of uh, the sequelae of untreated or undiagnosed sleep apnea. Mo again, another summary slide, just really describing the extent of the areas of the body and our health that the sleep, uh, uh, the sleep apnea effects. It, this list is growing. Uh, these are the commonly recognized areas and more and more work is being done. Keep in mind that sleep medicine is the new kid on the block, so to speak, in terms of uh, diagnoses and healthcare disorders. We've only been really studying it very intensely for the last 30, 40 years or so, and we're really still uh, unearthing and uncovering a lot of areas where there is not an obvious link. For the purpose of this talk, we're going to talk about one of the most obvious links, and that's relating to sleep and heart disease. A little bit of background about what happens in normal sleep, uh, something called cardiovascular quiescence, and this relates to uh, what happens during non-REM sleep with the metabolic changes and sympathetic nervous system uh, activity changes uh, shown there. They're reducing and with a, part, a contrasting and increasing vagal activity. These changes are disrupted and essentially reversed in sleep apnea. In addition, the typical dipping of blood pressure that is seen in uh, sleep uh, in normal health is not seen. And that's another uh, function that there is a heightened sympathetic activity during the night. And studies have shown that f patients with heart failure have significantly less uh, total sleep with, uh, com in comparison to patients without heart failure. Taking it further at the uh, physiologic level, what is going on here, we can see the actual effects uh, from the hypoxia and the elevations in CO2. The lung stretch is reduced as well uh, with stroke volume, blood pressure changes, and arousals. And these are ultimately sensed at the receptor levels which trigger the autonomic changes that I just referred to previously with increased sympathetic uh, nervous system uh, tone and decreased uh, parasympathetic nervous system activity. And then the resultant changes at the vascular endothelial level ultimately translate to the long-term consequences that we took, we're going to talk about here in uh, reflecting ultimately heart failure, arrhythmias, uh, mortality as well. Sleep apnea has been independently linked to multiple cardiovascular outcomes, and uh, the hypertension link has been probably one of the longest uh, standing established, but also with stroke, myocardial ischemia, arrhythmias, 
uh, other cardiovascular events and ultimately all cause mortality as well. And it was early back as 2010, it was thought then that in tr treatment of sleep amnia, could represent at that time it was thought to be a novel uh, uh, way to reduce cardiovascular health outcomes. I don't think anybody would argue right now we would think of it as a novel way. I think it would be an expected way to uh, help reduce cardiovascular outcomes as well, or improve them, I should say, reduce the negative outcomes. Again, a little bit uh, uh, repeating here, the links with hypertension, heart failure, and atrial fibrillation, and Andrew, Dr. Horton will speak. Uh, quite a lot more in detail on some of the heart uh, links, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'm just going to give a little more of an overview here and also note below diabetes, which is a, a very, very strong link as well. So why should we care? Well, because of, as I mentioned, obesity is a strong link. Uh, we have uh, the, all the heart connections we've talked about, and ultimately thinking about the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic activity affecting the endothelial layer on the uh, circular, uh, circulatory system, that's where we're seeing these long-term consequences. And then when we think about this, what happens when we leave it untreated, we see the, the effects there, the, the multiplied risks of leaving sleep apnea unaddressed. Uh, this really translates to bad outcomes for our patients as seen here in variety of areas with cardiovascular related that we're seeing here, arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, um, and, and these are not insignificant, they're not trivial, and I think that's where we have clear room for uh, improvement and making a difference. Uh, put, put another way from the previous slide, we, uh, we're just seeing if we treat the patients we can pretty much undo what we just showed on the previous slide as well. So essentially, quality of life has ultimately improved, and that's really improving on the short-term uh, short uh, ramifications, but the long-term uh, is the effects that we see. And hypertension, again, this is I want to keep this at a summary level because I've got quite a few slides to get through, and I know there's a limited time frame here. So about 50% of sleep apnea patients are also hypertensive, and for those who are in the primary care world, having a patient with difficult to control blood pressure or previously controlled blood pressure who is now presenting with more difficulty with blood pressure, that's often a sign that they may have developing sleep apnea that may be wor worthwhile to look at. The non-dippers that I referred to previously, the non-dippers at nighttime, the normally blood pressure would show a dip, which is the physiologic dip, and they don't dip when they have sleep apnea as well. And a significant high prevalence has been noted in patients with resistant hypertension in one study referenced there as well. Obesity uh, is a predictor of uh, uh, sleep apnea in obese patients predicts AFib. And so this is a link that's been shown quite uh, strongly as well. So we know that AFib and sleep apnea is a growing uh, uh, Rec growingly recognized uh, association, and now obesity playing an independent risk factor there as well. That brings, ties this in very nicely that we need to pay attention. Again, a study in patients, uh, obese patients who are less than 65, both with and without sleep apnea, and we can see the frequ cumulative frequency of AFib on the vertical axis there as well. Sudden cardiac death, I think this is one of the most uh, striking slides when you look at what when sudden cardiac death occurs in the general population, you will see in the usual hours it's between 6 a.m. and noon, except when you look at patients with sleep apnea, those events are occurring more typically between midnight and 6 a.m., in other words, usually when they're sleeping. And that is a very, very uh, a strong uh, indication of how sleep apnea is impacting the cardiovascular system in this situation. Arrhythmias, again, uh, we can just show multiple of these uh, association of slides of how they're associated more frequently. Uh, the, the, the solid bars of the patients with sleep apnea, the white bars of the patients without sleep apnea, and you just see an increased uh, frequency of arrhythmia occurrence. And this, several studies are shown here, again, looking at prevalence of uh, heart failure and sleep apnea, and, and they vary but the, at, at least 10%, but some as high as 50% as well. And some of those were not just looking at obstructed sleep apnea. I mentioned at the beginning we're speaking about obstructed sleep apnea. Some of those uh, studies did reference also central sleep apnea. And it, uh, pulmonary hypertension, not to be left out as well, a uh, gr growing uh, association is being linked with uh, obstructed sleep apnea and pulmonary hypertension. Uh, multiple factors are implicated here as well. So what 
can we do when we have recognized there is this concern? Well, treatment can really show a positive impact on these uh, negative cardiovascular outcomes that I'm referring to. And as CPAP has been shown to be the, uh, one of the most uh, effective ways we can uh, positively change this uh, negative uh, wave of uh, information that I was just sharing uh, previously. And again, specifically in atrial fibrillation and across other areas as well, we'll see that CPAP treatment uh, makes a distinct difference. Uh, and again, Dr. Horton may speak to this again a little bit more. Uh, this is one of the real reasons why we are working very closely with our cardiology colleagues to help them take care of their heart patients in a more uh, consistent and a per a permanent fashion as well. So just a couple of words to tie up on sleep apnea and atrial fibrillation. Uh, it is independently associated uh, with sleep apnea, and about half of the patients with AFib will be found to have sleep apnea if you look for it as well. And treatment reduces, uh, treatment with CPAP reduces AFib recurrence across, across patient groups as well. So treatment also helps reduce uh, cardiovascular disease readmissions to hospital as well. And we're seeing this is some uh, initial data where more of these studies are ongoing as well. Uh, we're concentrating for the purposes of this webinar on cardiovascular disease, but it also applies to other uh, readmission uh, risks from other diseases as well. And there are multiple uh, consensus uh, statements, uh, positions put out there by the cardiology literature as well as the sleep literature in supporting and endorsing the points that I've been making is that there should be this growing awareness for the sleep physicians to work very closely with their cardiology colleagues. And again, just more references to some of the guidelines. I'm not going to belabor these points, but just really these are there to, as a reference point. So a few words really about how we have um, tried to improve the outcomes of our patients who have comorbid uh, heart disease, cardiac disease, and sleep apnea. Well, we, we've been addressing this, and I've been, as the director of our sleep program for several years, been trying to grapple with it. And I'm not going to tell you we're at a perfected state. It's still a work in progress. But we're, the first steps involve uh, educating and uh, helping our cardiology colleagues understand the true ramifications of what sleep disordered breathing does to their patients, and ultimately how, if we don't address this, it really doesn't help them do the best job they can do for their uh, cardiac patients too. We've gone as far as de deploying a sleep navigator in the cardiology office at times, and this worked great before we went to the electronic health record with Epic when we were on paper charts. It worked very well. With the electronic records, we have to tweak that and uh, sort of fine-tune that process, but this is literally embedding a person dedicated to helping screen and identify appropriate uh, sleep patients who could be uh, Send for sleep testing or sleep consultation and screening with stop bang. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people are very familiar and aware of that process as well. And we're also extending that to a pilot for stop bang uh, performance on all in patients, not just our cardiac patients as well. So refer once the patients have been identified as at risk or concerned to having sleep disorder breathing, we offer either referral directly to a sleep specialist, one of our physicians, or we have some advanced practitioners. Uh, in sleep, as well as the cardiology uh, pr practitioner has the option to send the patient directly for testing as well. And in those patients, we close the loop as the sleep uh, doctors who interpret those studies. Once we see that patient had a study referred by a cardiologist not been touched by one of us, we will then arrange and take over the sleep management. And last point I wanted to make uh, was we've recently instituted the Somnoware sleep management platform across our system, and that is uh, we're still um, uh, in the infancy of it to some degree, but our ultimate goal is to improve our efficiencies and most importantly to really get a proactive stance on sleep, uh, on, sorry, on CPAP adherence, which is really the key. Once we initiate treatment, we want to make sure that the patients are staying on treatment. So. Uh, again, more of our experience and in summarizing, uh, about 50% of the cardiac patients remain undiagnosed or untreated, so we have a great opportunity. A simple questionnaire like a stop bank or some other alternatives can be very helpful. How to actually go about deploying that is still some of the, I think, the opportunities we have, the works in progress. 
Keeping in mind also to be eligible for insurance coverage for sleep apnea therapy, the patients are required to have a validated sleep diagnosis um, and also sleep documentation in the pre-testing face-to-face visit. And once the testing is done, the diagnosis is uh, quite easily obtained by uh, an easy to do, for example, a home sleep study um, using the WatchPad device, for example. And adequately treated sleep apnea has been associated with improved cardiovascular outcomes and reduced readmissions as well. So the success of sleep apnea therapy does ultimately depend on patient compliance. And the, we, what our goals are is to, uh, it should be optimized to help improve their cardiovascular uh, outcomes as well. And that involves education of both the patient and also our cardiology colleagues as well. And bear also in mind that compliance monitoring is now mandatory, certainly across Medicare and also many commercial insurance payers as well, to allow the patients to continue to stay on their therapies with CPAP. So goals of treating the patients with PAP therapy short-term, long-term, short-term clearly to improve the immediate symptoms, of uh, fragmented sleep, uh, uh, prevent the patients having gasping breathing, uh, keep the airway open, improve the quality of uh, sleep. And long-term, what I was alluding to is uh, essentially improving uh, mortality, morbidity, uh, improving cardiac uh, uh, outcomes, decreasing the consequences, and ultimately improving uh, quality of life. If you flip the coin the other way, what happens if you leave it untreated? Well, they're disastrous. Uh, the short term, you can see uh, accidents, uh, workplace accidents, uh, in the medical field, errors can occur, decreased quality of life, uh, you, you name it, and pretty much everything can be tied to uh, undesirable consequence of untreated sleep apnea. And long term, I've reiterated several times already, the uh, how do we treat the patients? Uh, and I'm going to get through this fairly quickly, weight loss, avoidance of the factors that worsen the airway collapse, uh, positive pressure therapy, surgery, dental appliances, and I'm going to just at an overview level here, uh, CPAP, BiPAP, and other modalities of positively uh, splinting the airway open, oral appliances may be available for the milder patients, and then surgical options. And we really have very limited armamentarium for treatment, but really keep in mind that uh, our CPAP, it really does become the treatment of choice. And just finishing up on the last couple of slides here, the, uh, the, for those not aware, CPAP is really just a pneumatic air splint of the airway. Uh, the therapies and the technologies in that area have also improved dramatically. Um, last summary slide, I'm just going to, this is from taken from the American uh, Association of Sleep Medicine on their social media campaign in the last couple of years. It's a great easy acronym, Sleep Apnea Hurts Hearts, and just uh, I think it, this is very powerful for sharing with any of your other medical colleagues who are interested to know about these links. Thank you, and I'll end there. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for that insightful presentation. Uh, before our next presentation, we have a word from sponsor, Itamar Medical. WatchPad 300 is an innovative home sleep apnea test that utilizes its proprietary peripheral arterial tone signal, also known as PAT. WatchPad measures up to seven channels, and within one minute post-study, the raw data is downloaded and auto-scored, differentiating obstructive and central events, providing an AHI, RDI, and ODI based on true sleep time and sleep staging. WatchPad true sleep time reduces the risk of misdiagnosis and misclassification that has been reported to be 20% with HSATs using total recording time. The AHI and RDI derived from the WatchPad were clinically validated with an 89% correlation to PSG, and the PAT signal is an accepted measure for adults with OSA in the 2017 AASM HSAT clinical practice guidelines. If you have an interest in learning more about the WatchPat, please contact Itamar at infousa at itamar-medical.com or visit itamar-medical.com. Now I am happy to introduce Rodney Horton, MD, who is the founder of 
Texas Cardiac Arrhythmia, a practice based in Austin, Texas. The program includes 19 cardiac rhythm specialists and care for over 6,000 atrial fibrillation patients annually, with AFib ablation volumes over 2,000 per year. The group actively studies and has published on the role of sleep apnea in the formation and progression of atrial fibrillation, as well as the influence that optimal sleep apnea management has on atrial fibrillation treatment efficacy. Welcome, Dr. Horton. We're ready to hear your experience. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Um, as uh, stated earlier, my name is Rodney Horton. I'm based in Austin, Texas, although I, I cover uh, really most of Texas, uh, heart rhythm specialist. Uh, so you may wonder why a heart rhythm specialist would be speaking about sleep apnea, because it, but it's become much more evident in the last five to ten years that uh, one of the missing elements for why we struggle with uh, treatment and eradication of atrial fibrillation is the uh, underdiagnosis or misdiagnosis of, uh, of sleep apnea in this population. Here's a general pre uh, prevalence of sleep apnea. 25% uh, of adults worldwide are thought to suffer from the uh, uh, condition. 80% in the U.S. alone are thought to be undiagnosed. Um, in the cardiovascular population, roughly half of the people with cardiovascular disease we believe uh, suffer from sleep apnea. 80% similar to the general population are also uh, under, uh, either underdiagnosed or undiagnosed. Now, but the effects are fairly significant uh, from a comorbidity standpoint. Um, uh, sleep apnea has been associated with the uh, drug-resistant form of hypertension, congestive heart failure, uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, stroke. I'll actually give another uh, 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 slide on that topic. Uh, incidence of pacemakers, arrhythmias, which is obviously our focus, coronary disease, and atrial fibrillation. Um, if you look at um, the uh, increased risks, uh, if you leave sleep apnea untreated, uh, there's a twofold increase in the risk of stroke, a uh, twofold increase in uh, death uh, from sudden cardiac arrest, uh, and from cardiovascular deaths, five time increase. Uh, risk, 42% uh, uh, increased risk of prevalence of atrial fibrillation following ablation. I'll have several more, <laughs> several more slides on this topic. Um, the progression of the uh, cardiovascular disease and its influence on sleep apnea is fairly well understood. The, the presence of sleep apnea and all the different um, changes that occur physiologically with the sleep apnea lead to increase in the uh, sympathetic nerve activity. Uh, metabolic dysregulation, inflammation, oxidative stress, um, endothelial dysfunction, and uh, intermittent hypoxemia, of course. And all of these things lead to hypertension. They also lead to a pressure load in the left atrium, which leads to atrial fibrillation and ultimately leads to uh, these end organ diseases. This is a little bit of a, a busy slide, and I apologize. Uh, it basically, it's talking about the mechanisms of uh, how the sleep apnea affects these things. So it's a little bit uh, redundant on the topic of the slide previously. So I'll move forward in the interest of time. Um, the treatment of AFib, um, I'm sorry, the, the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea re, um, influences the uh, recurrence of atrial fibrillation post ablation. We've noticed this for some time. So for the last 10 years, we've looked at different independent risk factors for why some people undergo ablations and are not successfully ablated, and uh, sleep apnea is definitely one of them. So if someone has sleep apnea, they d undergo an ablative procedure, and the sleep apnea is either not diagnosed or not treated, then uh, the success rate is roughly half of what it is if they either have treated sleep apnea or if they uh, do not... Uh, um, uh, have the diagnosis of sleep apnea. And here's a meta-analysis. Uh, again, I'm getting a little granular on this. I'm sorry, I'm an electrophysiologist, so we focus a lot on, on treatment of these arrhythmias. But in this meta-analysis, uh, what they looked at was um, the uh, presence of sleep apnea and the presence of treated sleep apnea. And this was true whether you, on the top of this slide, I don't know what, how well you can see this, but at the top you can you can see that this wasn't just ablation patients. This was also pharmacologic suppression of AFib. So if someone had sleep apnea and they were on a drug to suppress AFib, 
they were far, far more likely to be successfully suppressed than if they had untreated uh, sleep apnea. And at the bottom slide is similar results, almost identical results, with uh, ablative strategies for treating uh, um, AFib. If the patient had treated sleep apnea, then the uh, results were uh, far better than they would be otherwise. So the key points here are the diagnosis of sleep apnea with CPAP can reduce the 12-month post-ablation recurrence rate up to 42 percent. Uh, active screening of the sleep apnea in all patients who undergo treatment for atrial fibrillation is uh, frankly imperative, and the use of sleep apnea is an independent uh, predictor of uh, successful outcomes and reduced morbidity with atrial fibrillation. Interestingly, in the um, cardiovascular population, we found that body mass index was not a, a correlate or a, a, a entirely a predictor for sleep apnea, so it was unrelated to that. Here was a um, uh, study looking at um, ablation uh, in the presence of sleep apnea and, abl and ablation in the uh, uh, presence of untreated sleep apnea. <clears throat> and you can see it's a little hard to read all of the, the uh, slide, but you can see that there are uh, two sets of two uh, um, uh, curves here. And in the top set, you have uh, ablation in the patient without sleep apnea. And almost superimposed upon that is the um, success rate of ablation in the patient with sleep apnea that was treated with CPAP. And on the uh, bottom, the, the two that were also almost superimposed were those who had uh, CPAP-treated sleep apnea with no ablation and those with ablation but had untreated uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So in both, of, interestingly, CPAP was as effective as ablation in this, in this particular study. Uh, and uh, obviously, the, if someone had sleep apnea and it was untreated, then uh, ablation was much less likely to be successful. Uh, here's, this is almost superimposed on some, one of the previous slides that I showed, but uh, ultimately what's showing here, three curves. On the top curve, and this is looking at AFib recurrence in percentage, if someone had sleep apnea, underwent an ablation procedure, and the sleep apnea was not treated, their recurrence rate was almost 80 uh, percent. However, if they had sleep apnea and it was treated, or if the patient did not have sleep apnea and underwent ablation procedures, then those were actually statistically the same. Um, here's another uh, talk, and again, I'm sorry for the, the redundancy of these, but these are different studies from different um, entities, and they're basically finding the same results, and that is, this was uh, from, well, we were one of the centers doing this, uh, looking at 3,000 patients who underwent uh, um, ablation for AFib, and 640 of them were diagnosed with sleep apnea. And what we found was when those patients with sleep apnea were treated with CPAP, their freedom from AFib was significantly improved. Again, this is similar results that were found from, from other centers in different, uh, uh, different parts of the world. Here was a meta-analysis looking at um, patients with catheter ablation with obstructive sleep apnea uh, without, with and without treatment with CPAP. And again, whether or not the patient, if the patient had um, obstructive sleep apnea, treating the, uh, the uh, disease with CPAP was an independent predictor or of successful uh, outcomes. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit quickly over this. This is just a Mayo Clinic uh, slide showing very similar uh, findings from uh, the previous slides that we showed. Uh, the recurrence of AFib in 12 months um, in patients who had sleep apnea that were uh, uh, untreated versus treated uh, was almost uh, double if they, uh, the recurrence was almost double uh, if they had sleep apnea and was not treated compared to those that were uh, treated with uh, CPAP. Um, this was looking at the incidence of stroke in the, presumably from cardioembolic events. So this was similar to what we showed before, but this is actually looking at stroke incidence. So in this study, what they found was that first time cardioembolic strokes on average in this population was 22.9 percent. And uh, if the patient was diagnosed with, with obstructive sleep apnea, it was actually 25 percent. And if they did not have obstructive sleep apnea, it was only 8.2 percent. So it, it indicates that the, the sleep apnea not only dramatically increases the likelihood of uh, resistant hypertension and some of the other uh, comorbidities that influence 
the presence of atrial fibrillation, but it also influences the complications associated with atrial fibrillation, in this case, uh, stroke. Uh, this was a Chinese meta-analysis looking at uh, all-cause and cardiovascular mortality in patients with obstructive sleep apnea with or without CPAP. Uh, those that were treated with CPAP did much better, uh, and there was a 113% increased risk of all-cause mor mortality and 173% increased risk of cardiovascular mortality when patients had sleep apnea and were not diagnosed or were not treated uh, with CPAP from that uh, uh, from that study, uh, this is a little bit of a busy slide. And let me just go to the next slide because it's actually about the same topic. Uh, so this is a little bit easier to see. This was our our center looking at um, uh, when someone undergoes an ablation for atrial fibrillation. We're looking at um, where the triggers are. Why is the patient going into atrial fibrillation? And one of the things we've been focusing on for the last 10 years is uh, not just isolating pulmonary veins, but looking for non-pulmonary venous triggers for atrial fibrillation. This study indicates that if somebody had obstructive sleep apnea, they were almost four times more likely to have a presence of atrial fibrillation triggers outside of pulmonary veins. And so if you did a standard uh, pulmonary vein ablation or isolation procedure, uh, you were far less likely to successfully fix these people. Uh, if they had sleep apnea, you had to ablate the non-pulmonary venous triggers as well. So this really indicates that the progression of the atrial fibrillation is uh, more advanced in the patients with uh, sleep apnea, whether it's treated or not. So it does actually influence how we actually go about uh, uh, performing the ablation procedure. And this is from the same uh, study, and it shows that it's a little hard to see. So you have here uh, three different graphs at the top, and all of those are st statistically the same. And you have one graph below them that is significantly worse. That one graph represents patients who had sleep apnea that was not treated, um, I'm sorry, that was treated, but that they only had uh, their pulmonary veins ablated and not PV triggers. And so it, it basically underscores the fact that if these patients have sleep apnea, um, the way we go about their ablation is a bit more uh, thorough. Uh, and we do have to spend a significant amount of time uh, targeting uh, structures that are outside of the pulmonary veins if we hope to fix them. And again, this helps to explain a lot of those previous slides where you saw patients with sleep apnea, frankly, having worse outcomes. Uh, when you tried to ablate them, when you tried to put them on medications, they were much less likely to be effective. And this is one of the potential um, explanations for that. So uh, we have focused for the last um, couple of years on screening these people because we've recognized that obviously patients come from, uh, from all over to various centers to, to treat the atrial fibrillation. And of course, our focus is to, uh, to fix them, either to put them on a medication that they're happy with or to do a, a, a permanent catheter ablation procedure to uh, um, improve their quality of life. And so um, as, uh, as a critical part of that for us, we do need to screen and identify those patients that have um, a sleep apnea. Uh, because failure to do that will um, leave us with uh, significantly lower results. So with that in mind, sleep apnea, this is just a reminder that you can't always tell whether it's snoring or someone's trying to start a lawnmower. Um, the initial screening is actually fairly easy. Uh, we've uh, been implementing this for over a year now. Of course, uh, electronic medical record has somewhat changed the workflow in most uh, clinics and uh, outpatient settings. I think um, that medical assistants play a bigger role now in uh, data entry and to uh, basically bring in patients, reconcile medications, that sort of thing. And we simply asked our medical assistants to include in the various uh, duties that they have to include uh, a, a quick uh, um, a questionnaire with regard to uh, sleep apnea. It takes the patients less than five minutes for that. Uh, if the questionnaire uh, indicates that the patient should be uh, actually tested for sleep apnea, 
uh, that will be uh, brought to my attention when I, so before I walk into the patient's room, I already know whether this is going to be uh, one of the topics for discussion. And generally, I do have to spend some time explaining this to the patients, but I don't have to spend a whole lot of time, usually less than five minutes of, of discussion with the patient explaining, look, I realize you came here for AFib, but uh, this, uh, much like un untreated hypertension, this is an important uh, variable that we have to at least uh, rule out and get under control if you really want to be fixed from your atrial fibrillation. Once you explain that to them, uh, they don't have much trouble with it. Uh, this is the uh, stop bang quiz. This is what it looks like. Uh, there is a consent form involved with uh, um, sleep apnea testing. Um, originally, so uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, the way you would diagnose uh, sleep apnea was largely with these sleep centers, these uh, polysomogram uh, uh, centers. And patients would almost universally complain about them. They would come in, you have to, ha it was, um, you'd be attached to so many different electrodes on your face, scalp, limbs, chest, fingers. And then you would be uh, sleeping in a room with a bunch of other strangers. And so most people that I sent to those centers, uh, they didn't get a, a, a wink of sleep. And so it, it would oftentimes be inconclusive with these tests. So now uh, I think with the home-based portable monitors, it's really changed the way we approach this. And it's much less uh, of an in, um, imposition to patients. They can take this home with them. Uh, they find it very uh, um, easy to do, and we get results back very quickly. Uh, so the um, AHI uh, measures the severity of this obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, I suspect the, uh, the next uh, speaker may go into greater detail about this, uh, but uh, just suffice it to say that an AHI of less than five is believed to uh, represent an absence of, a, of sleep apnea. Five to 15 is considered mild. 15 to 30, moderate, and then over 30 would be considered severe. Uh, this is uh, what uh, one of the outpatient home monitors looks like. Um, and um, this can be sent home with a patient after they watch a, a quick short video. And uh, they bring it back um, the next day or mail it back into us for the, play, for the um, uh, phys uh, patients that live far away. And uh, it's not a huge imposition to them. They usually only have to wear it for one night, and we have uh, enough information to make a diagnosis. Uh, so I will, um, let me just fast forward to the treatment. Uh, and I'll, I'll basically talk in very brief terms about this, because once we make the diagnosis, uh, we depend very heavily on the sleep specialist to take uh, uh, to take uh, a bigger role in this part. We want the patient diagnosed, we want the patient treated, but uh, to be fair, I'm an electrophysiologist. I'm not the best person to be managing this. We do give them a few uh, uh, bits of advice with regard to lifestyle changes. If they are overweight, we do uh, encourage uh, losing weight in various ways. And um, a 10% reduction in weight is associated with a 20% reduction in apnea episodes. So it's not. It's not a trivial issue, but uh, I usually leave this to the experts to manage. Uh, that, I think I'll just conclude there and leave this to the next speaker. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Horton, for sharing your real-world expertise. And uh, now a word from our sponsor, Itamar Medical. <clears throat> As the awareness for sleep apnea and its associated health risk increases, the wait time for a PSG may increase and unintentionally exacerbate disease burden and reduce patient satisfaction. Watchpad Direct mail order service was designed to help reduce this backlog. Watchpad Direct allows you to expand your HSAT program quickly with no upfront costs and with minimal time and effort from your office staff. Once implemented, your office staff will have more time to care for the patients and the other critical activities that improve the practice's performance. If you have an interest in learning more about the Watchpad Direct program, please contact Itamar at infousa at itamar-medical.com or visit itamar-medical.com. 
I am pleased to introduce Yelena Tumashova, MD, who is double boarded in neurology and sleep medicine. She has more than 15 years of experience practicing sleep medicine, including 10 years experience as director of the Sleep Disorder Center at Advocate Lutheran General Hospital. For 12 months, she has been participating in a pilot of a cardiovascular sleep medicine satellite clinic at Advocate Heart Institute in Downers Grove, Illinois. Welcome, Dr. Tumashova. We're ready to learn from your expertise. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope uh, part of the audience is still awake, and I try not to repeat the information you already provided by two other speakers and maybe concentrate on the practical aspect of the diagnosis and treatment of sleep apnea. So uh, I'm going to skip a lot of slides, and obviously it will be available as a reference for you. Um, important for a member of the audience who's not a sleep specialist, there is an um, HI score we always measure, and HI stands for apnea, hypopnea, and there is slightly different definition, but the common score per hour, that's what we pay attention to. Most common uh, form of sleep disorder breathing is obstructive sleep apnea, although in cardiac patient, uh, mixed apnea or central apnea could be quite common, especially in CHF population. Very common condition overall, mostly males, obviously obese uh, patient more likely to have sleep apnea and uh, diagnosis of hypertension, probably the most common diagnosis in apnea patient. Could be a lot of different symptoms and signs and what I notice in my clinic, frequently the patient if the male patient himself rarely will report those signs or symptoms, but if there is a spouse or family member with them, they will be addressing most of those symptoms and they will be probably the more reliable source of information. So we do ask to bring family member if it's available and it does help to education of the patient family to help them understand the importance of diagnosis and importance of the treatment of this diagnosis too. What was mentioned before by a speaker, uh, 5 to 15 mild apnea, 15 to 30 moderate apnea, and more than 30 uh, severe apnea measured by HI score. Uh, and surprisingly, most of my patients will fall into category 30 and higher. And uh, definitely negative uh, sleep apnea diagnosis, not always negative per se, because if you have a high-risk patient and the portable home sleep study did show low AHI does not mean you excluded diagnosis, maybe more workup is indicated. Um, stop being questionnaire was mentioned before, very common practical aspect. Obviously, in nowadays of uh, EMR, no one wants to spend extra few minutes clicking point, but if you look at the questionnaire, out of eight questions and if you have three yes answer, it's already positive. And most of us can profile the patient from a distance. You have a male patient who's overweight and tired of snoring. You, don't, you can skip the rest of the question. More than three, already positive. And um, Idemar Medical Company have a watch pad device, which we utilize in. It's definitely uh, much easier portable home sleep recording device, and we do use it now predominantly in cardiology uh, clinics. Um, what was mentioned by a uh, cardiology speaker, then uh, overnight polysomnogram study not standard, that's not exactly true. Follow-up sleep overnight study may be still indicated, especially with complex cardiac patients, CHF patient, when central apnea is suspected and when BiPAP therapy may be indicated. So when I talk to my patient, I tell them, yes, portable study is a great uh, initial diagnostic tool, but follow-up in-lab study may be still required, but that's more titration or treatment part. Um, when um, we look at the sleep apnea prevalence, it was already discussed, cardiac uh, comorbidity extremely common. I have my typical uh, top 10, which was discussed by other speaker, and arrhythmia, cardiac arrhythmia, obviously, is one of the uh, biggest comorbidity and concern. Um, 
What do we do treatment-wise? Because what I notice again as a sleep uh, doctor, there is a CPAP stigma exists. Cardiologists less likely to re refer to sleep specialists if they think CPAP machine the only answer. Because nowadays we do have other technology and modality to treat sleep apnea, and the patient need to know about it because if they come to sleep clinic expecting CPAP the only answer and they don't like this answer, they may never show up to the sleep clinic. So we do have APAP machine, a little bit easier for the patient. There is a male, female version of it. There is different algorithm, modality change, and bi-level um, machines, BiPAP machine may be more helpful for a complex patient like a CHF patient. Uh, dental appliance, uh, Another option for mild case of apnea, it's also for folks who fail standard therapy. There is certain indication and contraindication, and you want to spend time later, you can look into it. Inspire implant therapy, that's something we started about a year and a half ago. We partnered up with um, a company and started offering it through one of the hospital in our health care system. So we implanted uh, 28 cases uh, since we started the program, and this is a very good tool for non-compliant uh, patient, or, and also it attracts a lot of attention from a patient who perhaps was on CPAP therapy, but I call them CPAP fatigue cases where they don't do it uh, as they're supposed to if they're non-compliant anymore despite of therapy being effective in the past, we have other options and it's definitely need to be uh, offered to the patient. Uh, remedy implant not uh, indicated for obstructive apnea, but because we're talking about cardiovascular uh, cases, uh, CHF with low ejection fraction frequently don't respond to standard CPAP or BiPAP therapy, and ASV therapy may be contraindicated for them. So this is a new modality, Remedy implant is available and it's done by cardiologists uh, and um, electrocardiologist frequently the one who does this procedure. Um, we talk about results and obviously we all understand why it's important, but I think we all need, especially in the sleep world, to have a good strategy how to work with our cardiology colleague to bring awareness. And we develop cardiovascular sleep pilots um, in our institution and pilot was developed based on the fact that sleep apnea frequently underdiagnosed, that evaluation is cumbersome and we lose a lot of patients because they don't want to deal with the process. We have a lot of um, cardiac comorbidity where if left untreated could lead for more uh, complication. We have a lot of unnecessary admission for heart failure due to untreated sleep apnea. So patient uh, definitely high cost uh, to healthcare. And we do have now new opportunity with more convenient and efficient access to diagnose and also treat those patients. So, uh, our goal was fully standardize and provide the best quality of care for cardiac patients with sleep apnea. We want to address associated arrhythmia and cardiac comorbidity, and we want to focus on reduce unnecessary admission and or readmission to preventable arrhythmia, CHF, pulmonary symptoms, and coronary event and strokes. Uh, vision was we want to be uh, Referral center of uh, cardiovascular sleep medicine. We want to provide higher level of care across the system. Our healthcare organization now the biggest in Midwest, so we want to have standardized approach to treat those urgent cases. We want to identify sleep apnea, reduce m mortality and morbidity, but also simplify access to testing and treatment, and also be able to monitor treatment efficacy and align with outcome-based practice and population health initiative. Um, the algorithm we created, and that's been uh, slightly more than uh, a year, high-risk patient will be identified by cardiologists by administrating stop bank questionnaire. In, in facility where we work, MA does the questionnaire, and frequently patient has questionnaire in the waiting room when they're waiting to be seen by cardiologists. 
Then cardiology clinic have uh, home sleep test kits, and we use ITMR uh, medical uh, watch pad devices available at cardiology site. We started on one site, but now we have three cardiology clinic have the home sleep test kits available. The staff, usually the same MA or nurse who trained to administer Holter monitor, also trained to demonstrate uh, watch pad application. And then sleep doctor get assigned to interpret the study and cardiologists get the report back within 48 to 72 hours. We're trying to incorporate now into EPIC EMR. We recently started to all inpatient, outpatient switch to one EMR, and hopefully it's going to help us to remain on the same page and have those red flag patient addressed more urgently. Uh, Cardiologist responsible to notify patient about result and refer to cardiovascular sleep clinic for comprehensive consultation management, and it's a role of sleep specialists to evaluate, manage, and report back to cardiologists. Um, we started pilot in March of last year, so we used one device watch pad by ITMR Medical. We completed 250 studies by the end of April. We estimated that out of 250 uh, study, 83% were abnormal, and abnormal mean HI more than five. Uh, we projected the volume um, of the study per clinic will be 30 to 50, and uh, that's definitely going to increase because now more and more cardiologists involved in the, in the pilot on multiple locations. So we projected the referral from cardiology clinic to sleep clinic will be 40 to 45 patients per month based on 80 plus percent of the abnormal result would need to be addressed. And we created satellite cardiovascular sleep clinic and cardiology office, which now have monthly schedule. And that's allowed us to see the patient inside the cardiology office. It's all a patient who been screened by cardiologists with watch path procedure and identified as positive. And we projected that it will generate downstream revenue like CPAP order and so forth. What I think uh, the most important uh, part of our uh, project was to create common algorithm for everybody in the system can uh, use. So every cardiology clinic will have a stop being questionnaire as an opening a conversation. We'll have home sleep study to identify patient and then we'll have opportunity to urgently refer patient to the specialist and then it will be feedback loop from sleep specialist back to cardiologist to let them know how the patient doing and what modality they're using. And uh, so far, it's been successful. There is a lot of uh, a lot of uh, stumbling blocks, and there is a lot of uh, future development. And it, we think it's a lot of opportunity for cardiologists and sleep specialists to collaborate in the future. And we hope that our goal eventually. Um, will be to get those patients screened and tested before the next cardiovascular event occur. And that's my little clinical aspect of this very complex but also very simple condition. Thank you, Dr. Tumashova, for an excellent presentation with such important information. We are about to begin the audience Q&A. If you haven't already, please input your questions into the Q&A chat box on the bottom left of your screen. As those questions are populating, we have a message from today's sponsor. It is estimated that 50% of the nearly 92 million cardiovascular disease patients have sleep apnea, and 80% of these patients remain undiagnosed, presenting a significant health risk that is avoidable. Itamar has worked closely with sleep specialists and cardiologists to develop its total sleep solution. The total sleep solution is a simple yet comprehensive program to effectively screen, diagnose, treat, and monitor therapy compliance to optimize patient outcomes. Itamar has developed best practices while working with both cardiologists and sleep specialists to create a customized workflow to seamlessly integrate this four-step process. If you have an interest in learning more about the Total Sleep Solution, please contact Itamar at infousa at itamar-medical.com or visit itamar-medical.com. 
Now let's take a look at our first audience question. Uh, presenters, I expect to start by calling on one person to answer uh, the question, and then um, for anyone I did not call on, if you would like to jump in after that, please do. Um, and just please remember, if your phone is muted, you will need to unmute it um, in order to, uh, to speak during this Q&A. Uh, Dr. Horton, I will send this question to you first. Uh, would you eliminate uh, the yes, existence of OSA that. before Thanks ablation? For we typically do. So when a patient comes, even when a patient comes to our center specifically to get an ablation, uh, they already receive the uh, uh, screening uh, before I even walk into the room. And so we at least begin that conversation. Now, um, a, a corollary question could be, well, do you postpone the ablation procedure until after uh, they've uh, been diagnosed and undergo therapy? We don't typically do that. Uh, I think if you look at the efficacy re, uh, results with uh, treatment versus non-treatment of uh, obstructive sleeve apnea, I think that uh, I treat it a little bit like getting hypertension under control or doing some of the other uh, treatable um, uh, elements uh, and comorbidities to managing atrial fibrillation. We simply make sure that they uh, are uh, screened, uh, they are tested, and if they are diagnosed that we uh, uh, really push them to uh, pursue treatment uh, in, in parallel with uh, whatever our um, um, ablation or our pharmacologic treatment strategy. Excellent. If anyone else would like to jump in on that, please do that now, and otherwise we'll move on to the next question. Okay, uh, Dr. Tumashova, let me address this one to you uh, because you had mentioned uh, using the Inspire um, implant or having a referral for that. Um, do you know if the cost of Inspire extraction is included in the initial patient cost if it is ultimately unsuccessful in treating the OSA? Well, I cannot give you this specific uh, answer because we didn't have any cases when extraction was indicated. I would assume so, but I would probably need to look up and see what the company policy and what's insurance uh, policy in regards. So if the uh, device implanted, I assume it was implanted for the right reason, and we do have a lot of screening process to verify that it's appropriate patient for this device, so they're more likely to be responder when device uh, extracted, so the only part could be taken out as actual stimulator because the other two leads, uh, sensor leads and the nerve stimulator leads cannot be extracted because it could be damaging. So, but I cannot tell you about the cost in specific. Okay, well, thank you for sharing what you do know about it. Um, if no one else wants to jump in there, I'm going to ask the next question. Uh, Dr. Patel, let me address this to you first. <clears throat> Somebody asks, aren't home sleep tests not appropriate for patients with comorbidities such as cardiac disease and pulmonary disease according to the AASM? Excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, exactly. As American Association of Sleep Medicine does have certain diagnoses for which their recommendation is the patient gets studied in lab uh, through the gold standard of uh, polysomnography, and that includes uh, neocard classifications three and four congestive heart failure patients, as well as patients with severe lung disease, um, certainly those on oxygen and, and pulmonary fibrosis and advanced COPD, as well as certain neurological diagnoses. And it, it also includes um, any significant comorbid sleep disorder aside from sleep apnea as well. Uh, one other group that we also will uh, generally tr uh, recommend to get uh, studied in lab, in lab are the folks with a very high BMI. Uh, BMIs, we're talking about uh, over 45 and 50 for sure. Sometimes you might get them approved for over 40 as well. And simple reason is that uh, a lot of the HSTs or home portable sleep monitor testings have not been truly validated in those patient populations. And so we can make a generally a good case to get those patients tested in lab. And most of the insurances are aware of that and they'll approve an in-lab study with the appropriate documentation. Excellent. Would anyone else like to weigh in on um, the HST issue for cardiology patients? Okay. Uh, Dr. Horton, I'll address this next question to you. Um, do you advocate sleep testing 
out of the cardiology office without a comprehensive management program that is relying on subsequent referral for positive OSA findings to a sleep center for treatment and management. Identifying um, patients that we think are going to be more difficult to manage from an arrhythmia standpoint, from a cardiovascular standpoint. And uh, so generally, we do, um, if, if I understand the question properly, we, we uh, initiate the screening, we then uh, refer the patient for uh, an evaluation, and then of course, if the uh, testing indicates the patient even has mild sleep apnea, we will then get a referral to a sleep specialist to validate this and to confirm the diagnosis before instituting a treatment strategy. And we don't um, manage that treatment strategy. We use that entirely through, uh, through the sleep specialists. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Tumashola, um, is APAP, auto CPAP that is, uh, safe to use uh, with these patients? Well, it depends what category of patient you're treating. And we're talking about patient, uh, cardiac patients, CHF with low ejection fractions, APAP not uh, the standard therapy for those cases. So those complex cases definitely will need titration study in lab, and they're more likely end up with either BiPAP or if they have preserved ejection fraction, ASV is an option. But if I can also jump on earlier question and uh, just add one specific, if you have very high risk cardiac patient whose home study showed uh, negative HI or less than five HI, it should not prevent cardiologists to refer this patient to see sleep specialist because additional testing may be indicated. If your clinical index is high, even if the initial study was negative, that the patient require uh, more evaluation. And um, the way I explain it to my cardiologist co uh, colleague, for example, if you have one normal EKG, will you ever say it's 100% exclude atrial fibrillation as a possibility? Absolutely not. So if you have a high-risk patient, please pursue evaluation, comprehensive consultation, or additional study like in-lab recording. Excellent. Thank you for weighing in on both of those. Uh, Dr. Patel, uh, given that CPAP compliance can be low, uh, what is the primary mode of treatment that you would recommend secondary to CPAP? So if CPAP is uh, not tolerated or failing or the patient just declines that choice of therapy, uh, the next two options really depends on severity of the baseline sleep apnea. The oral appliance therapy that has been um, you know, discussed and referred to uh, is a reasonable second-line therapy, but it is really most effective in the mild to moderate patients. Um, when you have a very severe uh, AHI index, the oral appliance therapy has not been reliably uh, uh, effective. Most of the studies looking at oral appliances have shown at best they reduce AHI by about 50%. So if you've got a baseline AHI of 60 or 80, you're not really doing a great service with an oral appliance. So, but clearly for the mild to moderate patients, they can be a, a, good, a, a good second option. Uh, and as I said in my presentation, really this is a mechanical structural problem of the airway collapsing and the, we're really out of a lot of choices. So surgery is the ultimate last option, so to speak, and amongst surgery there are a variety of choices. The ear, nose, throat uh, surgical colleagues uh, can do the uvulo triple, uvulo triple, u triple p, uvulo pharyngoplasty. I'm twisting my own tongue here. So that, that's a very uh, a common procedure done, but unfortunately, again, that is not reliably effective in a lot of patients as well. Significant number of patients regret having had that done after the fact uh, if they knew before what it would be like. Um, and then you've got really advanced surgical options. You've got the max, uh, mandibular maxillary advancement procedure, uh, you know, which is a jaw advancement procedure. A lot of people don't want that. The Inspire implant that was uh, discussed. And, and the old-fashioned uh, last resort was a tracheostomy, which very few people want. So 
beyond CPAP, very honestly, options run out very fast. And so uh, I, I really try to get my patients to embrace PAP therapy, CPAP, whether it be BiPAP. And, and I just want to make a point here on CPAP. I see this quite often, uh, or more than I hope would hope to. A patient may be deemed as a intolerant of CPAP, and if it's an intolerance issue due to pressure, many, if not most, of those patients will do great on BiPAP. And to Dr. Tumashova's point, they would do great to come in for a BiPAP in lab study and then maybe a BiPAP trial. So I would exhaust all PAP op options before looking at something else. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Horton, are there any characteristic changes in the PAT signal that suggest heart failure? Oh, okay, no problem. Are there any characteristic changes in the PAT signal, the peripheral uh, arterial tone signal, that suggest sure heart failure? I have, I mean, the other, the other um, speakers may be able to speak more about this than, than I do. Not that I'm aware of, but uh, I'd be curious what Dr. Tumashova says. Well, I, I'm not aware of the specific difference in the signal, although uh, we need to emphasize that watch pad device able to identify central apnea, which is a different kind of apnea and more common in CHF patients, especially with low ejection fraction. So if the question is more can watch pad point what type of apnea patient have, the answer will be yes obstructive versus central, and maybe if you do have central apnea identified, that will be another reason to have a full study done in the lab with more uh, advanced recording. But I'm not aware of specific how the PAD signal can identify a CHF patient besides just addressing presence or absence of central apnea. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Horton, an attendee would like to know, uh, what specific questionnaire are you using for sleep apnea? A, a simple series of, of questions uh, that uh, basically they're screening questions. And, and obviously we don't want to uh, do formal testing on every single person that walks in the room because 100% uh, of the patients in our practice do not have sleep apnea. Uh, so this is a way of, of basically taking an unfiltered population and filtering out those that you don't need to concentrate on and then very quickly distill down to patients that uh, do need uh, further studies to, uh, to validate this, whether it be the home monitoring or the, uh, the formal in-lab study. Excellent. Um, and Dr. Horton, as a cardiologist in the room, I will um, also address this next question to you. Um, the elephant in the room is revenue. Uh, this attendee says, long-term management of OSA is expensive and labor-intensive. Sleep centers offset the costs of OSA management through performing the sleep study, whether in lab or at home. It is financially painful for sleep medicine specialists to receive consult Patients for management and only. A, Do you encounter pushback from your sleep medicine partners with uh, regard how to this? Reimbursement um, handles these issues in the next five or ten or fifteen years is likely to evolve. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, most of the doctors that we work with uh, who are sleep specialists. We have close relationships with for other um, uh, diseases, and so. With, they've been very um, uh, magnanimous in uh, helping with uh, the management of our patients, uh, whether uh, they uh, are involved in the original diagnosis or whether it's just the management part. But uh, you're exactly right. At the moment, um, it's a little bit of a lost leader to, to the sleep specialists sort of dominating their time uh, to uh, assist with the management. And yet, uh, making sure that patients are compliant and that they're optimally managed is is critical. If you don't do that, then you're kind of wasting your time with all of these efforts. Great response. 
Uh, Dr. Tumashova is monitoring possible with the implants. Um, you, I assume it's, we're talking about Inspire implant? So Inspire, and it may have been you who also mentioned uh, Remedy implant. Yeah, Remedy. Uh, with Inspire implant, there is a couple way to monitor effectiveness of the device. First of all, there is an in-lab titration study where we fine-tuning the individual setting for the patient, and we measure an AHI pretreatments and the different level of stimulation, try to determine the optimal level of stimulation, and that's one way to monitor. Another way to monitor compliance and efficacy after patient already fine-tuned and start this the maintenance therapy would do portable home sleep study with activated device and measure AHI, so that's effectiveness. And when you download Inspire implant information, it will uh, report will give you compliance report with per night and cumulative usage. So that's definitely give you idea similar what CPAP compliance report showing. And in my experience, although it's small we have a couple dozen of patients, there is really hardly any non-compliant patient when they go all the way to have an implantation and the hassle of study activation, they really using it because at that point, you know, they almost feel otherwise will be a waste of everybody's effort. So I think non-compliance with Inspire implant is a very minor issue. That's a very good point. Um, and I think in order to finish on time today, we will end on that note. Um, I would like to conclude by saying thank you to our three presenters, our sponsor, and to our audience members. An 11 question exit survey will fill your screen after I end the webinar, or it will appear early if you exit via the red X on the right side of your screen. Uh, be sure to take it if you want a certificate of attendance. Today's webinar was recorded, so you may rewatch for free anytime using the same link you used to log on today. Feel free to share the link with colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Email me at sroy at medcore.com with comments, questions, and future webinar suggestions, and visit www.sleepreviewmag.com. Thank you for participating in this sleep review webinar. Thank you very much.